I'm Jess and I've lived here in London for quite a few years now. I moved from the US back in the days before Skype and smartphones. <laughs> no, that's not true. We did have Skype, we did have smartphones, but actually the first time I ever came to London was when I was studying abroad and I somehow navigated the city without Google Maps. I don't know how, I really don't. Anyways, if you're planning to move to London from abroad as a foreigner, I'm gonna tell you about some of the costs that you need to think about and plan for before you make the big move to this very expensive city. I'll also be keeping a running tab of all of the costs associated with a hypothetical move for me from the US over to London if I was doing this right now. So you can kind of get an idea of what it might cost for my specific scenario. Everyone's is gonna be different, but that's okay. Also, I have a special freebie for anyone moving to London at the end of this video. So watch to the end to get it. Let's start with temporary accommodation. So I would never recommend anybody to sign on to or commit to accommodation before they actually see it. So you have two options. You can either fly to London, stay for a week or two and go crazy doing flat viewings and try to find some place within that time that you can then move into a few weeks down the line. Or you can just take one big trip here and that's like your big move and you can spend the first three to four weeks looking for the perfect place. During that time, you'll of course need to organize some temporary accommodation for yourself. As a general rule of thumb, I would say to expect that the flat home Hunt ends up taking you about a month because you'll have to go see a lot of places and it could take a while for you to settle on one that works best for you. Some people have companies that will arrange for their housing to be taken care of for the first month. So if you're being located by a company, definitely reach out to them and see if that's part of your package. Otherwise, you're on your own. Lots of people will use Airbnb for this temporary accommodation. I personally don't recommend Airbnbs to people in London because of its negative impact on the housing crisis which as a future Londoner, you will start to feel that. So you'll probably feel my pain. There are a couple of other options. You could choose to sublease somebody's room in a house share for like a month or so, which is an affordable option, albeit a little bit risky because it's usually a little bit not by the books, but it often works out. You can also rent a bed in a hostel or you can just book yourself a hotel room or an apart hotel for two weeks to a month. So for my hypothetical move, I'm going to book in for two weeks at Lock at Broken Wharf, which is an apart hotel that's really nice located in Mansion House. It's a bit bougie, so it's gonna cost me 1,260 pounds, but it's a great location and it's gonna be nice and comfy while I'm doing my search and getting settled in London. I'll have more about this apart hotel that I'm talking about in the description box of this video. A holding deposit. If you're looking for your own flat and you finally find the place that you love that's in your budget, you put your offer in and you're accepted you will probably have to put down what's called a holding deposit. And this tends to be equal to one week's rent. The reason that you have to give this over is for the agents to be able to take the property off the market and it kind of shows that you're committed to this. Then that money is put towards your first month's rent or is put into your deposit. If you're choosing to rent a room in a house share, in a house with other people, then this usually isn't needed. Now, let's say I'm looking for a one bedroom apartment for myself for 1,400 pounds a month, and that means that my holding deposit is going to cost me 323 pounds. Add it to the list. Rent and security deposit. Generally speaking, you'll need to put down a security deposit of around four to six weeks of rent. There is a legal limit to how much deposit can be taken, and it's five weeks for properties that are up to 50K a year rented, and up to six weeks for properties that are over 50K for the rental year. Make sure that that deposit goes into the DPS or Deposit Protection Scheme, and if it doesn't, it's illegal, so double check with the landlord or the agent that that is where your money is going. It essentially protects your money to make sure that the landlord doesn't just hold on to it for months and months after you move out. So one month of rent is 1,400 pounds, but we're gonna take our one week's holding deposit off of that. And five weeks rent for the deposit would be 1,615. Upfront rent. Here's the thing, if you're going to rent your own place, as in you're not gonna be moving into a house share with other people who already live there, and you don't have UK credit already, or a UK reference yet, it can be tricky to rent a place. 
it is quite likely that you'll be asked to pay some of your rent upfront. This could also happen if you're freelance or you're in a job in the UK, but you haven't had enough pay slips come in yet that can secure how much you get paid each month. The amount that you'd have to pay upfront ranges, it could be three months, but I've also heard of people in larger, more expensive properties having to pay up to a year in advance. If you're moving over here as part of a relocation with your company, this is something that you should bring up with your company because if you do have to put up a lot of cash, that's hopefully something that they're gonna be able to help you with. Otherwise, if you're on your own, this is pretty standard, especially when the landlord is working with an agency. Some private landlords might not require so much upfront. So because you just don't really know what the situation is going to be and what they're gonna be asking for, I would recommend having a bunch of money saved up in anticipation of you might having to front your rent. And if that's not an option, that's okay. I would definitely start out renting in a house share, which are usually much more flexible and wouldn't require any kind of upfront payment. It's usually just the deposit and the first month's rent. People usually also have the option to have a guarantor. However, it needs to be a UK guarantor. And if you're moving from abroad, I assume that you probably don't have somebody in the UK that they would agree to sign to pay your rent in case you stop paying. So I work for myself and if I was moving over to the UK now, that means I would probably wanna save up six months worth of rent. So for a 1400 pound flat, that means I would need to pay 7,000 pounds of rent up front. Ah. And to be clear, the 7,000 pounds includes that first month's rent that we already, already accounted for. Shipping your stuff. So if your company is paying for you to ship all of your stuff over to London, then I would maybe consider, yes, that you could bring quite a bit of your stuff over. But you do need to think about how it takes a really long time for stuff to get shipped over here, so you'll be weeks without it. And also, if you're shipping things like kitchen appliances and furniture, you might end up being in accommodation that won't be able to fit any of those pieces or those things that you've brought or you might end up with something like a furnished apartment and you don't actually need any of that furniture at all. My advice is to bring as little with you as possible. I personally moved over here with just two suitcases of mostly clothes and nothing really else. Something to consider is that Londoners are really short on space because we get a lot less for our money when it comes to flats. So Londoners tend to be pretty good at living with less things so that their flats can be tidier and not feel like overcrowded. So if you're coming from someplace like Australia or America where you're used to having a lot of stuff and a lot of space, it's going to be quite different. But I actually love the difference because it means that I'm much more conscious of what I have in my space. I save money because I don't just buy pointless stuff that I probably won't really actually use very much. And it kind of keeps my mind clear. You can get pretty much anything you need over here in London. So if I were to move here now, I would still probably just come with a couple of suitcases of clothing and then maybe I would send a couple of boxes of things over. And with shipping and custom charges, I would say that's probably gonna cost like 200 pounds. Flat furnishings. We have a really nice nice mix of flats in London that are both furnished and not furnished. Although I would say that as properties get more and more big and expensive, they tend to be unfurnished. But for most of us, whether you want furnished or unfurnished, you'll be able to find a place that works for you. I've lived in both unfurnished and furnished places up until a couple of years ago. I liked furnished because it kept my moving costs down and it also meant I didn't have to buy a sofa for a flat that I potentially was only going to be staying in for like a year. And then I'd have to sell it because it doesn't fit in the next flat that I moved to. Now that I'm a bit older and I'm looking to settle down, I want an unfurnished place because I want to be able to decorate it with the furniture that I personally like and furnished places can sometimes be decked out with a lot of Ikea stuff and I'm personally just very over Ikea stuff. Okay, so my furniture budget. So in a one bedroom flat, I would need to get a bed, a mattress, sofa, TV stand, and a few other big pieces. And I'm a big secondhand person. I love a good Facebook marketplace find. So I would probably find most of the furniture I'd put in my place for a lot cheaper than if I bought it new. So I would say that my budget it would be about 1,700 pounds to fully kit out everything. And I'd probably buy my own mattress. 
bits and bobs for your flat. So it's a bit easier to budget for those big pieces you need to get, but we always forget about all the small things that we need to actually live in a place like forks and knives, plates and cups and wine glasses and champagne glasses and whiskey glasses and gin glasses. A lot of glasses a toaster, cleaning supplies, all that fun stuff. But because people in London move so frequently and a lot of them end up leaving the country to go back to where they're from or just for a job or something, there's always people that are trying to either give away or sell very cheaply. And you can get pretty much anything, maybe even for free on Facebook Marketplace or on apps like Spa. And of course we have shops like Ikea and West Elm and department stores like John Lewis where if you wanna buy everything new, then you can go to those places. I personally am gonna secondhand most of this stuff. So I'm gonna say that like 800 pounds should be plenty to get all the little bits and bobs. Contents insurance. Every renter is required to have contents insurance for their flat. And this basically covers you if there's a theft, some kind of damage or something, and some contents insurance, if you choose for it to work outside of your house, then it will account for if you get robbed while you're walking around the city or something. Don't worry, that doesn't happen that often. If you move into a house share, you'll just wanna ask whoever the lead tenant is or the landlord who has worked out the contents insurance and if you need to do anything to be able to add all of your stuff to it. For my one bedroom flat, I am anticipating to pay around 55 pounds for the year for contents insurance. Utilities, depending on what country you're coming from, you might not be used to having to pay for utilities separate from the rent maybe it's included but in the UK generally speaking flats have separate utilities so that rent price that you're gonna pay does not include any of the utilities you'll need to pay on top of that utilities here are water gas and electric and I'm also looping in things like internet and if you want a uh, working TV cable I don't know what we call that here do we call it cable that's obviously not included either. As a single gal living in a one bed by myself, I'm expecting utilities to be around 150 pounds a month. And I'd probably wanna have two months of utilities saved up just to make sure that I'm covered for the first couple months I'm there. Council tax. Council tax is a yearly tax that is paid for by the occupier to the local council and it helps to pay for all of the things that you get in the borough that you live in, like trash collection and street lights. Each council charges a different rate for council tax. For example, Westminster is the cheapest in the UK, I believe. Wandsworth Borough is the second cheapest, but then some of the boroughs around the city are some of the highest in the UK. And each property has a different amount that it pays depending on what band it's in. When you go look at properties, you can ask an estate agent how much is the council tax on this property each year, but you should always confirm that yourself, which you can just do by going to the local council's website and typing in the property that you're looking at and it will pop up on the screen. Some people are eligible for a 25% discount. If you are the only person living in the property, you're a student or you're all students that live in the house and a few other reasons as well. So for one of the areas that I would like to live in soon, I've looked up council tax rates and because I will be living by myself, I get a discount. So I can expect to be paying about 120 pounds a month for council tax. So I wanna add two months into my savings pot. So I'm sorted. Pay as you go SIM. You'll wanna grab yourself a UK number as soon as you arrive to the UK because to set up some services and, and certain things and also for estate agents to be able to contact you, you'll need to have a UK number. I've got a link in the description box for a SIM that you can get sent to your country before you arrive over to London so you have it ready to go for when you land. It's just a pay as you go, so you'll just top it up with some money and add more money as you use it up. And then eventually when you have an address and some UK credit, you can get a contract if that's what you want. But I'd say start out with about 25 pounds credit and go from there. So let's add 25 pounds to the list. A TV license. If you wanna be able to watch the BBC, whether it's on live TV or on the BBC iPlayer, which is their like streaming service, then you need to pay for a TV license. This is paid yearly and you would pay this as soon as you move into your new place or as soon as you wanna start watching BBC stuff. I don't watch cable TV. However, I do love the BBC iPlayer because I love me some normal people and they have some other really good programs on there. So I'm going to factor this cost in at 157 pounds and 50 cents. Pence. 
why did I say cents? Before we add up this total, I do wanna say one thing that you should not pay for when you're moving over here, and that is an estate agent fee. A couple of years ago, the UK introduced a new law where tenants cannot be asked to pay for any fees when they're signing a new contract for a rental. So when you see a listing on Rightmove and it says, no agency fees it's like okay yeah that's literally the bare minimum you are not allowed to charge agency fees that's not that cool so if you interact with any landlords or agencies that tell you you need to pay referencing fees or anything like that that should be a red flag and tell them that you will not be doing that this doesn't apply though when you're moving into a house share and you're having to change the contract so that one person is off of it and then you go on to it but if you're taking over somebody's room and somebody's place in a contract that probably isn't something that you should be paying for or you can split the fees okay should we add up the total i think we need a drum roll and this is how much i should have saved up before i moved to london hypothetically speaking if that seems like a lot that's because it is remember that i've had to pay a bunch of months in rent up front i've chosen to stay in temporary accommodation that's very bougie but this is my hypothetical situation so that's what I'm gonna choose. So a lot of my stuff in this situation is a lot more expensive than what you might experience if you are, say, moving into a house share and so your rent is going to be half of what mine is, not even. You only have to put down one month's rent and deposit. You could stay with a friend or stay in a hostel bed to keep your first couple of weeks of temporary accommodation cost down. You totally can do it for less. Definitely for sure make sure you have enough saved up to cover all of the costs that you will need. And I promise to you something free, didn't I? So for people who are moving over to London, I have a free move to London checklist that you can get by just clicking the link that's popping up here or in the description box and putting your email address in and it will get sent to you instantly. You can print it out and you'll know everything that you need to do before you move over to London. And then once you move over and it's the first couple of months while you're here and you're setting your life up. And I have loads more videos to help for people to move to London from abroad. And you can watch a couple of them by clicking the boxes that are popping up here.